The theme of our webinar today is the power of an effective brand image. And it's part of our Get Your Marketing in Motion series that is sponsored and presented by Marketing Department Las Vegas and the team of Marketing Department 14 business marketing professionals. And um, we started out last week with the idea that you can't really steer something that's in motion. Um, trying to steer my car, my parents' car, as a kid, it was sitting in the driveway and I was playing around with the steering wheel. You know, you really can't steer it, it's not moving. So the theme of our whole series is get your marketing in motion so you can steer it. But today we're talking about brand image. And, you know, steering something that's in motion, but in an unclear direction is bad <laughs> because you're, you're, you're not going to end up where you want to go. Um, so you want to put your business in motion on the right track and your brand image is the key to focusing all your business and your marketing activity. Um, it focuses your identity, your offerings, your services, your products. Um, the value that you present to your clients and who is your target market, your brand identity holds all of those things. It's kind of like your name. If you could imagine somebody asked you, what, what is your name? And you said, well, I'm Tom. No, I'm David. No, I'm Sally. Um, you know, that sounds pretty ridiculous, but often, you know, without a strong brand image, that is how we're presenting our business in a very unclear way. So once you get your brand image in, um, in focus, then that's going to focus all of your marketing and it's going to focus your message and it's going to empower all your results. So um, for myself, I'm going to introduce myself very quickly and just say president, founder of marketing department. LV and networklasvegas.com. Many of you received the, the networking announcements that we send out every Tuesday morning of the latest updates in Las Vegas and what to look forward to in the next 30 days. And um, I'm going to skip through some of this. I'll just say that, that for you know the last 15 years, I have been providing digital content marketing and relationship network services. Uh, and now I have a team <laughs> and um, about a year ago decided, you know, I don't want to do all this on my own. I want a team. And so I began looking for the most talented people in Las Vegas and and have an amazing team. Now, one of our team members will be presenting today. His name is Ed Ferrillo. And so um, our mission in the marketing department to ensure that Las Vegas businesses spend less effort on their marketing while getting better results through outsourcing their marketing department. We are the outsourced marketing department. And um, let's move on to Ed Ferrillo. Now about Ed Ferrillo, I found out last week, um, Ed and I, I were um, strategizing, okay, what are we going to do about today? Because he has a conflict today. However, what we actually did is took his most powerful webinar and we recorded his message. So you're not going to miss a thing of Ed um, except the opportunity to ask him questions. And I'll, I'll put it this way is, is that any questions you have for Ed, write them in the chat. I'll make sure Ed gets those questions. So Ed is definitely present today, um, but not um, here live. Okay, so um, Ed um, has 30 plus years in marketing and brand leadership. And I, I met Ed in Connecticut um, when I lived in Connecticut, and uh, we worked together on his um, website. And his, you know, move, his move from being 15 years, the chief marketing officer of all of Cigna Insurance. And you see this little umbrella here. This is the Traveler's Umbrella, Traveler's Insurance. Ed was on the team that created this logo 
and and you can see other clients that you know Ed has Dow, um, ANA, um, Dinner Salon, Good for You Network, and I'll I'll be sharing you know Lincoln Financial Group, um, St. Joseph Aspirin. So Ed, Ed's really um, gotten around in in marketing, and what we did is we created his um, his um, consulting business after he left Cigna, and um, now he is giving webinar, I mean uh, seminars with the ANA. And let me share a little bit about that. The ANA is the world's largest trade organization, Fortune 500 and 1,000 companies, and Ed has offered 52 day um, and one half day workshops on brand development and customer engagement. So he um, gives, presents those brand workshops all over the, the country. And, um, and his clients are nonprofits, and you um, see Dow Chemical, Young Entrepreneurs Group, Housing Authority, um, brand building for them. And then he's got some um, additional net, um, new ventures, Good For You Network, which is a network that focuses on presenting new, good news that people need to hear. Um, MD Insider creates big data for hospital and, and employee benefits groups um, about doctor performance. So this is a huge um, medical network. Um, PBS Dinner Salon, um, he's the co-creator and producer. And then um, I brought him over to a client here in Las Vegas about a year ago. Uh, we worked on their branding, um, uh, personal injury attorney, Paul Pata. Um, many of you may have heard of Paul Pata. Anyway, how do you differentiate a personal injury attorney? That's where brand comes out, come, becomes very, very important. And uh, because there's so many personal injury attorneys and you see their billboards up all over the city. We came up with a focus statement that, that focused the brand. It's not about the injury. It's about the recovery. And suddenly the set uh, Paul Padilla apart as focusing on recovery and um, he's connecting with recovery networks all over the city now. And, um, so you can see how a brand can, uh, you know, has power to, um, to begin to just um, permeate the entire market. Thank you so much for that introduction, David. And uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, be with you here um, today. Um, the whole notion of brand is, uh, as David probably kind of indicated in the introduction, is that I've had the opportunity to just work on a a lot of different enterprises, companies, organizations, some startups that really have um, pretty much the same principles of success behind them. And that is really understanding what your brand is all about. Um, and people oftentimes think that the brand is cosmetics, but um, you know, in terms of how you look or what your logo is, but it really is about the substance of who you are, but more importantly, understanding who your customer is. It starts there. Do you really understand who your customer is, um, and do you uh, know how to appeal to them? There's an awful lot of different descriptions out there of what a brand is, uh, and this happens to be my favorite one. It was written years and years ago from a gentleman by the name of Walter Landor, who is the founder of Landor Associates, which is one of the preeminent brand consulting firms out there that develops a lot of global brands, and I've had the opportunity to actually work with their organization a number of years ago. And look at some of the words here. A brand is a collection of perceptions, perceptions about a product, service, or organization. It is the experience you have when you interact with the people in the organization or use the products or services they offer. In essence, the brand is what you remember after the facts fade. And this is true whether you're in a service organization or whether you have something that's in a can or a box that comes off of a shelf. It's all about perceptions, experience, the people you interact with. Um, that is true 
uh, today more than before. And that whole notion of it, it's re what you remember after the facts fade. Because half the time we can't remember what we read yesterday. We just know we have certain perceptions that have been built up into our mind. Um, and that's where the true art of this comes in to really think that through. But understanding customers is really tough because frankly, it's probably easier for us to understand other people in our lives than understand ourselves. Um, we start to think about what we're all bombarded with. There's all sorts of issues out there, product quality, pricing, promotion, but now it gets more complex because we're faced with issues of sustainability, responsible sourcing, what's the culture of the company that's out there, what's my perception, what's the perception of the brand or me, all the stuff that's going out there. And there are so many things out there that are out to encourage how we're different as opposed to how we are alike. So that really poses another big challenge for marketers overall in terms of what we do. But I like to try to simplify it, really simplify it, and keep a simple notion because the execution gets pretty profound and detailed. And that is, do you really, really know your customer? Can you visualize them? Do you love them? And do, you, do they love you back? And it really is about love. And we'll, we'll give some examples to really help prove that point. In the workshops that I do, I typically go through about six different areas. We don't have enough time for that today. We're going to glance uh, through about uh, three different areas. But we start off usually in the clouds with why do you exist? Why on earth am I here? What is your belief system? And then we go into segmentation or the type of people that you're after. Who do you want to attract? What separates? What joins? Uh, what are some of the common values you have amongst your customers? Um, and then the next area is how do I make a connection with them? What is their needs overall and how do I make that emotional connection, not just a rational connection? And then another area is what are you competing with? Not just who are you competing with, what are you competing with uh, in their brains overall? Going back to understanding customers, what I just said, there's a lot going on in their heads. There's a lot to deal with. And you're not just having literal customers, uh, literal competition that you have out there. There's a lot in their head and certain biases that exist um, that you have to deal with. Then there's differentiation. What are your assets overall? What's in your brand toolbox? What do you have there that can really help differentiate you from that competition? And then lastly, experience. What is that experience overall? How do you really engage them? What is the courtship that you really build with them overall? And what are all the different areas that you can touch them in a way to build advocacy and loyalty? But today, we're going to really just focus in on about three of them. The segmentation one, who to attract, what common values are. Secondly, how to build your assets or how to differentiate yourself. And thirdly, how to engage what that experience should be. So we'll do some fairly high level examples and then hopefully we can drill down a little bit as we get into some of the low hanging fruit discussions as well. But in terms of the whole first area of seeking common values across segments, you can get really bogged down in terms of all the different types of people, all the different types of segments, whether the demographic segments like age and uh, ethnicity and regions of the country or, or different values and psychographics and the types of things like they do, whether they're you know, musicians or gardeners, you know, or sports enthusiasts. And you can quickly get to the point where you think that they have nothing in common. I think one of the greatest examples of an organization that's figured out how to deal with a variety of different segments and really look at their common values is Nike. And if you think about Nike in terms of where they were way back in 1978, they were basically a shoe company. 84% of their business came from footwear. I mean, if you fast forward into relatively recent terms, you see how big their, much their revenue has grown, but it is far more than just footwear and apparel and equipment, you know, their competitors way back in 1978 um, in the footwear business are still primarily focused in that area. Yet Nike has been able to really um, transform, them, transform themselves into a powerful lifestyle brand by really looking at what the common values are across their audiences. So they, they segment based upon the activity. So there are just a few examples of basketball, running, golf, tennis, yoga, skateboard, and you start thinking, what on earth could a, an inner city kid who plays basketball at midnight have with someone who's playing golf who's an investment banker on a Saturday morning? 
And you think, well, if you looked at it demographically, nothing they have in common. But yet they have so much in common because it's that whole notion of how they perceive themselves as an athlete. And that's what Nike actually did. They transformed their company based upon how they segment and how they think about their customers and how they think about themselves, that it wasn't about the product. It was about their customer. So they transformed themselves from really focusing on what I call the soul of the shoe to the soul of the athlete. And if you looked at the different values of those that run versus basketball versus tennis or skateboarding, you start to see some similarities come, up, come out where it really comes down to obviously performance, personal statement, and really for serious athletes. So whether you are an amateur that just kind of runs maybe once a week or someone who's out there doing extreme stuff daily, it really is that similar mindset that they've been able to capture. And I think one of the best examples overall they've been able to do through all these different sports is when they decided to get into the skateboard business and they elevated the whole notion of a skateboarder as just as much as an athlete as a runner. As you will see in this particular commercial when they introduce their, uh, their foray into the skateboard market. All, all I want to do, all we want to do is just, just run, man. Just run. Some people swim. Some people ride bikes. We choose to run. That's just who we are. You're crazy, people! I don't get it. I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. Most people, you know, they, they, they just don't get it. They don't understand it. If they did, they'd respect it a little bit more. We're regular guys. As soon as we do this, we're criminals. You have to do that here? Yes, there should be laws to protect us from these people. Oh, I used to run. No. When I was eight, you almost hit that lady. Well, we get a lot of stares, we get a lot of smirks, people are unpleasant and rude. Get out of the house, man! And uh, we hear what they're saying. But we're not deaf. Yeah, there's runners everywhere. Good runners, too. And they all go through the same thing. Runners aren't criminals. Running's not a crime. I, mean, I want to run, I want to run, I just want to run. If we treated all athletes the way we treat skateboarders, instantly elevates them to the same level where you might have been thinking of them as the kids that were hanging around the 7-Eleven. No, to Nike, they are athletes demanding the same level of respect. And they entered that market and really became one of the more powerful brands in that particular category. Let's kind of give another example kind of quickly. Let's talk about coffee, which a lot of people like to talk about. This is one of my favorite illustrations. When you think about Starbucks versus Dunkin' Donuts, now known as just Dunkin', um, there's their brief history that's up there. And you might think that, okay, they're definitely competitors. Uh, they offer, uh, they have real estate, they sell coffee and some stuff that goes with it. But that may be just all they really truly have in common when you start getting into their customer level. Now, this is how they really look at their customers themselves. First, on the demographic level, if you just looked at demographics, it really wouldn't tell you much. You might see that Starbucks skews a little bit more female, maybe a little bit more younger, maybe with millennials, more affluent professional. With Dunkin', it's a bit more male, a bit more baby boomer, maybe more average household income. But then what do you do with that? How do you use that as a basis to truly build what your brand's all about? Well, you get deeper as you get into behavioral research where you really start looking at your customers. You observe them, and you don't need a fancy research to do that. You just really observe who they are and what they're doing. Um, and these are words that um, each of these brands use to describe their customers. Um, Starbucks um, refers to their customers as aspiring screenwriters. The moment you say that, you get a visual. You get a visual in your head in terms of who they are, and you actually have seen people hang out in the Starbucks that are with their MacBook and writing things. Socially concerned, more experienced seekers. Duncan refers to their customers as the average Joe or the average Jane. More transaction focused, more family oriented overall. So you start to see that picture that starts to come out. And if they look at social media indicators in terms of what's happening in social media, Starbucks, more college age, early adapters, music enthusiasts, and Duncan more related to social moms. You know, the moms that go out and buy the, you know, the, the big, you know, things of coffee in the cardboard boxes and then go out to the uh, Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts, more sports fanatics, family travelers. Um, and by doing so, they start to be able to look at it in terms of what are the various things that they do to um, appeal to their customers. 
But even at looking at those different segments, they're still able to bring it down to just one word that really separates each one of them apart from the other. If you take those different segments for Dunkin' Donuts or you take those different segments for Starbucks and you start thinking about, well, what is the one word that it really sums it all up? With Dunkin', it's all about expediency. It's much more of a transaction. And with Starbucks, it's really about the experience overall. And if either ones try to get into each other's space too much, they would likely fail. The reason why they're both so successful is that they've both been very, very true to each of those uh, particular uh, shorthands of how they identify the common values amongst their customers. And I think this really little short video, it's a commercial that ran a couple of years ago from Duncan, really says it best. Delicious lattes from Dunkin' Donuts. You order them in English, not for Italian. America runs on Dunkin'. With John Goodman as their spokesperson, they captured the average Joe. Okay, our next uh, segment here, uh, module as I refer to them, is what's called the Brand Assets Tool. And it really sets this up as really a bullseye because that's really what this is all about. And it starts helping to build what your assets are, those types of things that you can do to set yourself apart to your customers once you've identified who your customers are. And that first area is points of parity. What is it you need to be necessary? What is it you need to be to be competitive? Uh, that if you're in that particular line of business, what are those things that don't really set you apart, but you must offer? And we'll be giving an example in a moment. And then more importantly is points of differentiation. What's going to set you apart? What are those things that are desirable by your customers, but also deliverable by you that you can really deliver on? And then ultimately reasons to believe the substantiation for people to believe that you can do what you claim that you're doing, okay? So that your brand doesn't become a false promise. And speaking about promises, you know, that is also something that gets embodied as well. This kind of gives a little bit more of an explanation of the criteria for what's desirable and what's deliverable. Desirability is much more customer-based. It's got to be relevant to them and distinctive and believable and is deliverable by your company. Is it feasible? Is it profitable? Can it be preemptive? Oftentimes you get into kind of work sessions with employees where you'll say things like, oh, any idea is a good idea. Well, not necessarily so. Any ideas that you have really have to be able to be feasible. Uh, does it culturally align with who you are? And uh, can it de deliver the profits that you're seeking? And at the core of it is a promise. This is usually a, just a short phrase or a couple of words that capture to the brand owner what you're ultimately promising to that customer. This may be the toughest part of brand building overall for everything else really comes out of that in terms of the executional elements. This delineates who you are, what you stand for, and also implicitly what you are not. Starbucks is not Duncan, and Duncan is not Starbucks, going back to our last example. And that's kind of inherent in the overall promise that would be for each of those organizations. And very importantly, it's not just about customers. It stakes out meaningful ground for your staff and your volunteers and your supporters and even those people in your distribution channel. And it's like not a slogan, but it's, it's, it's a sense of purpose. It helps guide internal decisions and all strategies. You know, David gave an example of something we worked on together before, and that particular brand promise is helping to drive that organization. Any of the corporations I worked in in the past or any clients that I have now, it comes down to those few words that really help uh, drive decisions and strategies overall. Everything from certainly the things that are most visible, like advertising, right down to your service experience and also the type of employees that you need overall. So let's give one example. And let's kind of go back to Starbucks because it's, it's a good one. We can all relate to it, and it's fairly easy to uh, explain this one. If you're going to open up a coffee shop, your points of parity, well, 
It better be convenient. You better have fresh coffee and you better have good service. That's not going to really set you apart and maybe you'll be successful. But I mean, those are pretty much the basics. But if you go into what your points of differentiation are, you think about Starbucks. Well, it is still about the coffee to a degree because they have a lot of different exotic drinks. It's very high quality coffee. Um, and yet it also speaks more from the product to the experience of being there. It's relaxing moments, rewarding moments. You can sit there, you can work. It becomes that third place that Howard Schultz talked about that no one knew that they needed. Because prior to Starbucks, everybody just thought you buy a cup of coffee, it's a transaction, now get it and get out of the, get out of the store. And also what's key for them is social responsibility. They really hang a lot of their brand related to social responsibility and issues. Some, and most of them work very well for them. Sometimes they don't work well for them. And when they don't, they tend to get off it and move on to something else, but still within that space that appeals to their customers. And then you start thinking about reasons to believe to deliver on that. Well, some of it's functional, like the fact that there's a fresh pot that's made every 20, uh, 30 minutes. They have well over 20,000 locations, the various drinks that they offer, the type of space that they offer, the trained baristas, they roast their own coffee, they have fair trade coffee that is out there. And one that really helped them stand apart and was very topical, especially a few years ago when we were talking about um, the, the Affordable Health Care Act, is that they offer health care for all employees. And a lot of organizations that have that kind of service um, the service operations don't offer that. So what does it come down to in terms of a promise for them? It's really about a rich, rewarding cafe experience overall. And if you think about that for a second, of course that is true if you go to a Starbucks retail operation, but that's also how they presented themselves if you're going to buy their product in a grocery store and bring it home. It's that same experience sense that they build the brand on that you want to bring into your house as well and how they've marketed themselves. Now, our third and last area is called overall brand experience. And this is the courtship. If you think about it, if you have somebody important in your life, be it a spouse, a partner, um, a, a good friend, anybody that you've attracted into your life that you've either kept in your life or perhaps you've scared them away, there is a courtship that exists. And those skills and behaviors that you use to attract people are very different from those skills and behaviors that you use to keep, keep people in your life and keep a relationship going. And that's the same exact thing with overall brand building. And if you do it and you do it well, you can transform your target audience into your media channel due to their advocacy for who you are and what you offer. It's kind of, um, just to give a, a couple of level set examples, in all the workshops that I do, I always ask about if there's Toyota owners in the group, and inevitably there are, and they love the Toyota. There's nothing particularly special about the car itself, but yet they've been able to master how those cars uh, the, be packaged to be sold to make it a lot easier, far better servicing, and being very, very dependable. If you go back about 10 years ago, there was a, quite a crisis that they were into. They had a problem with um, their brakes and there were accidents and some people died. Yet in the middle of that crisis, Rice University um, conducted a um, research uh, report asking about different uh, car makers, owners and so forth. And Toyota owners, about eight out of 10 people said they would buy a Toyota again in the middle of that crisis. And at the time, there was no domestic crisis or, or crisis of any domestic car owners here. And less than four out of 10 would say they would buy the domestic brand again. This is a testimony that if you do things well and you provide a really good experience, that actually becomes brand insurance. It insulates you or helps insulate you if trouble is going to follow you. And trust me, trouble may follow you because especially now we're in a lot of, in a divisive culture, uh, you may find yourself in the vortex of problems that you say, how do I get myself out of this? Well, if you've consistently treated your customers well, they oftentimes will give you that benefit of the doubt as you see yourself through this problem. And Toyota continues to thrive today. Another quick example is uh, waste management. And this kind of tends to underscore the importance of the little things that are out there, the little things that can separate you. <clears throat> and waste management is a, um, obviously, 
you know, they, they pick up trash. That's one of the things they do. And if you can brand a dumpster, you can brand almost anything, right? But they also have a very, very advanced knowledge when it comes to toxic waste cleanup and environmental leadership. Yet when they did their own research against institutional buyers, government buyers, municipal buyers, as well as consumer buyers, what came at the top of the list of the most important impact on their brand was smiling truck drivers. Well, you think about that. You say, how could that be more important than environmental leadership? The folks that are collecting the trash and the waste are now invading your neighborhood and invading your company. And the smiling truck driver is a piece of low hanging fruit that helps them stand out. All right. Now let's kind of get into an example and go into the, uh, the module itself. I want to talk, give Southwest as an example and talk about the airline business overall and how I like to utilize that as a basis for my, a cynical view of how to build a brand experience. Um, there's a lot of Southwest airline uh, fans out there. And when you think about air travel, a lot of people don't really want to think too much about it. It's not a very pleasant experience. But most of the airlines that have built themselves have built themselves based upon hardware and location and all of the um, financial data that goes behind that. And um, Herb Kelleher, who was one of the co-founders of Southwest, started off with, it's going to be an airline, a company about employees first. He even cited employees were number one over customers because if the employees are treated well, the experience, the customers will follow. And he actually built it all in a whole notion of love, focused more on low volume airports. All planes he's going to utilize were 738, 737s. Um, they were easier to maintain, uh, cheaper to maintain overall, and you don't have to have uh, different crews that know different types of uh, aircraft to maintain. Celebrations for employees that tie into their brand, but also where their connections really figure out how to make those connections simpler and quicker and far less uh, lost baggage and far less lost connections overall. A lot of common sense that went behind this overall. So I want to talk about uh, experience in a little bit of a different way, and we're going to go back into the airline business in just a second. But I think a lot of us have actually grown up with this, <laughs> this game called Candyland. And if you probably remember it as a kid, or if you use it with your, your kids or even your grandkids, uh, this uh, should look pretty um, familiar to you. But I've renamed it, and I hope they don't sue me for this, but I have renamed it. It's called Brandyland. And instead of being the land of sweets, it's Brandyland, the land of tweets. It's exhausting. We're faced with it day in and day out. Um, celebrities, business leaders, politicians, it's a constant barrage and it's exhausting. Yet if you are um, a purveyor of a brand, business owner or whatever, you are not immune to becoming a subject of this and oftentimes more than not, the subject is not going to be necessarily pleasant. So there is an opportunity to sort of turn this on its head a little bit and think about brand experience a little bit differently. I noticed over the years in, in marketing world, whenever we talked about experience, we always acted as if, oh, the customer is just dying to have a relationship with us. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. They're not dying to have a relationship with you. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, when you, they are in, when you are in their life, they kind of pretty much want it to be pleasant, painless, and they want to be able to get out of it what they, what they put into it, at least get that back. But if we start thinking about this a little bit differently in terms of what this journey is, because it is a journey, and we're going to utilize the airline business as an example because that is a literal journey. But no matter what product or service you have, it is a journey for your customers. If you're, if you're selling a can of soup, it's a journey to figure out what you want, how do you utilize this thing, and will I use it again, and how painful or painless will it be. So let's sort of take this a bit of a step at a time in terms of what this journey may look like. I call it the vital journey, a little bit from more of a cynical basis. Now, clearly, in any kind of you know marketing or brand experience, you always have to think about what do you want people to know before, during, and after they make a decision? And that's fine and good, but I would suggest you ask the questions a little bit more cynically. So instead of thinking that they're just dying to hear from you, 
really ask yourself a question in terms of why are you bothering them? Or from their perspective, why are you bothering me? And why does it matter? And when it comes to that point of considering your product, well, why on earth should I change what I'm doing now? And be honest, how much of a hassle is this going to be? And then after I bought from you, what happens now? Is anything going to happen? Are you going to be bombarding me with surveys that you may not read? What happens? And then the bottom line after all this, you know, what did you really sell me? And then afterwards, why should I even like you? And you think about all these different brands that are asking you to like them. Um, why should I do that? So if you kind of take that cynical view and use that as sort of an overlay or filter as you go through every step, you might actually end up developing an experience that's far richer and more meaningful for them and more relevant and profitable for you. Let's kind of go back into the airline business a little bit as an example. Now, what I'm about to show is a caricature. Just as you look at a caricature that somebody drew of a celebrity or a politician, on one level, it doesn't look anything like them. And on the other level, it looks just like them because it gets your imagination going. So this is an extreme caricature overall. I call it the worry journey related to the airline business. You could also think about what the worry journey is related to your product or service or your brand and figure out how you flip it on its head. All right. So if we take that before learning, why are you bothering me and why does it matter? You think about all the different commercials sometimes you see from some of the major airlines. And from the cynical perspective, my answer is kind of like, well, we have pretty commercials and music. Or we have a new logo. Or we have time-sensitive pricing. Or we need to overbook our airplanes. <laughs> now, if you go into the next phase in terms of, well, why should I consider you? And why should I change what I'm doing now? And how much of a hassle is this going to be? Well, we're not really asking you to change. Because if you think about the legacy airlines, they still pretty much are the default choices for many, many people, especially on some of the various airline sites. And we hope you have no choice. And we think you'll tolerate the hassle because you just want to get there. And by the way, making a change will cost you. It used to be $150. Now it's on average about $200. Now, what happens now after I purchased? Well, expect delays. Expect vague answers. Expect to have your gate moved. Expect to be overbooked. Expect long connection gates. Expect to miss your connections. Expect crankiness. Expect unhappy employees. We've all been there. You get it. And then afterwards, after I've actually gone through this all, why should I like you? Good question. By the way, where are my bags? And then the bottom line, what did you sell me? What did you really sell me? A soulless transaction. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. You're flying eight miles up into the sky into this tiny test tube in the grand scheme of things. And for this to become something like this, where you're a soulless transaction, doesn't really make much sense. But that's what happens when you start looking at people and everybody is just as a spreadsheet. Now, if we take a look at Southwest Airlines and say, well, how they really kind of approach this overall, you know, why do you, but they don't really bother people. Their commercials aren't really that intrusive. They're really pretty much all about their employees. They're meaningful. They focus on their love logo um, in terms of how important that is. And then it matters because they know that uh, their competitors have really mistreated you, then why should I consider you? Why, why should I change what I'm doing now and how much of a hassle is this going to be? Well, our employees, this is from Southwest perspective, our employees are happy and they're treated well. They're recruited for character, not just skills. Think about that for a second. Recruited for character, not just skills. The character of what your brand is all about because all of your employees, inside or out, are going to be a reflection of that, that brand. This translates to their treatment of you as a customer. And our brand as Southwest is based on love, and we're serious about that. And our fundamentals are practical. Low activity airports, easier turnaround, quicker turnaround, less missed flights, 737s only, there's a maintenance advantage, and this translates ultimately to better fares. And no frills doesn't mean no treatment. And their boarding process works better. They even look at some of the other airlines that are trying to emulate uh, Southwest's way of boarding. And if you think of purchase in terms of what happens now, well, enjoy the flight. You might be entertained and you'll want to help us clean up. If you think about anyone who's actually flown on Southwest, oftentimes you'll get 
flight attendants that are quite skillful at entertaining you and are also very, very adept at taking some of the basic things that are required and turn them into competitive differentiators. And we'll show a little bit of that in a second before we close up. And this whole notion of you want to help us clean up, Southwest usually asks their um, customers, gee, can you please help us clean up before you leave? And I see people willingly do that and happy to do that. I've flown so many times on the other legacy airlines cross country and the people leave, they leave Cheerios on the floor, they leave papers on the floor, they leave, and that just shows that there's a sort of a disrespect for their brand of where they just flew. With Southwest, that respect is right there. And it's not the highest priced airline. And why should I like you? Well, I like you because you're happy. As an airline, you're happy and you make me happy. You're confident as an airline, you make me confident. And I've witnessed so many times, I've flown probably millions of miles at this point, where you see these transactions that happen where they turn what could be some situations where there's a lot of confrontation with a customer into something that's actually quite positive. And the bottom line, what did you really sell me, Southwest? You sold me love, appreciation, confidence, what a journey should be. Contrast that with the caricature that I just talked about with regards to the journey that people go through with some of the other airlines. So what I would propose for you, anyone that's serious about brand building, is that you think about that vital journey. You think about that disturbed journey, the worry journey, as I called it before, of where all those bad touch points are in your category and how you can turn them on their head as long as they align with what your customers want and the values that you did in the earlier parts of the segmentation ex exercise. And just that we're gonna show just a, a few seconds of this as an example of uh, one of the flight attendants that took some of the, 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 the most rote things you do, which is about seat belts, and turns it into a point of entertainment. You can pretend to have your attention for just a few moments. My ex-husband, my new boyfriend, and their divorce attorney are gonna show you the safety features. It's been a long day for me. To properly fasten your seatbelts by the flight and the buckle to release really lift up on the buckle. Position your seatbelt tight and low across your hips like my grandmother wears her support bra. If you get mad, you want to take your toes down. There's eight ways to get there. 2 forward exit door, short wing window exits, 2 rear exit door, signs overhead, just the lights on four lead each exit. Everybody gets a door cross in the seat back block in front of you, along with dirty diapers, chewing gum wrappers, and the peels and all that gives you leave for time. It's a safety information card. Safe. Right. I think you get the drift on that uh, in terms of Southwest. It's, sometimes it's those little things, but again, at the end of the day, it's about who is your customer? Do you know what their values are? Do you know how to emotionally engage with them and provide them a great experience? Back to you, David. Let's think in terms of our own companies and our own brand image. You know, we've looked at these huge corporations, Nike, Adidas, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts. But in reality, when we're looking at our companies, we're looking at smaller companies. We're not looking at huge corporations. What are the variety of people to whom you need to appeal? Because that's the first question that is going to help establish your brand identity. So who wants to, um, to share with me what variety of people do you need to appeal to? Katia, what are the variety of people you appeal to? Probably coming from a different country, the point is that I have a different view about brands because the obviously I'm more connected to that kind of brands. And so for me, for example, I have a lot of brands I'm connected to for what regards my motorcycle passion. And uh, so that is a different way to, to look at the brands. Because obviously they elicit an emotion, as you said, very often we connect to brands and into that sense. Okay, and you know, who are your customers? So in, uh, into that, uh, after that, on a, uh, the smaller companies uh, have to brand themselves towards like uh, branding uh, the business owner, trying to be a influencer in your area and network and uh, obviously my uh, target is uh, small medium businesses that have uh, the idea to grow and so 
that's the point in which they're probably in business from at least a, a couple of years. They have uh, five to over 50 employees and uh, they're trying to uh, look at their uh, business from a different perspective. Okay, so um, smaller businesses, they're, they're probably more newly established, would you say, as opposed to someone that's been around 30 years or more? And uh, Yes, there is that too. Okay, and they're in a growth phase. Um, it's, it's like we are starting out and, and we have this larger vision. We have a goal. We're not at the goal, but, um, but we're, we're moving in that direction. So it's, it's an idea of, of you know, an, that exciting growth phase as opposed to, you know, a Starbucks, a Dunkin' Donuts is, is, is wanting to preserve their market. Um, they're focusing on continual improvement. They're not necessarily um, focusing on growth and change. Nike, when it was Blue Ribbon Sports, yes, um, they had a huge vision um, and they grew into that vision. But Blue Ribbon Sports might have been more like the client that you're serving at this point, would you say? In the, in the vision sense, uh, so also a small business, you always have to have your vin vision in front of you from the perspective of how to build. It doesn't matter if you are in a, in a, a basement. A lot of big businesses uh, in the United States started into a basement or a garage, and they are famous for that. But the point was that their uh, leaders built a brand that was into the sense of being so they already already acted as those bigger businesses. So that is where the trick is. It's to execute a plan with in mind the final result and not to set yourself short from that perspective. Then obviously there are cases in which it goes the right way. There are cases in which it doesn't and there are probably reasons for that. But I think that... Uh, um, there is a planning and branding is part of that plan to build your business to the next level. Uh, the only aspect of branding, it's, it's something that has to move in time. And also the example that you made with Nike, they evolved their brand to, in the different stages of their business to move to the next level. Okay, so self-awareness, self-perception, uh, you know, what part does that play in a brand? Um, if you perceive yourself as, um, you know, as a small company, there's nothing wrong with that. If you perceive yourself as a restaurant um, in, in a, you know, local city and you're going to have one location and that's how you perceive yourself. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you perceive yourself as, uh, you, you, you have a, a fast food um, restaurant in one city, but you, you say, you know, really, I'm McDonald's. <laughs> uh, that's where you see that, that perception, that brand identity and perception really influences where you're going to go as your business. And you know, once again, it's, it, you know, everyone doesn't have to have this, this global vision for their business. However, um, it's true that how we perceive ourselves and how our clients perceive us is going to make a huge difference where we end up. And um, I saw this when I was in the church and it, it was like some churches perceive themselves as being about a 30, um, 30 people in active attendance. And no matter what pastor they had, no matter what program they had, they'd always be about that size. And you think in terms of networking groups, uh, there are networking groups that, you know, have you know, 12 or 13 people. There are networking groups that have 60 or 70 people in them. They perceive themselves differently. And I saw those churches that um, they would, uh, you know, the, the church would maybe go down to 
20 members, but within a year or so, they were up to 500,000 members simply because they perceived themselves differently, where the 20 member church stayed 20 members forever, no matter what kind of leadership it had. So um, self-perception is, is very important to our brand image. Okay, so what are the low hanging fruit tactics um, for in terms of brand image? Um, uh, last week we spoke of uh, low hanging fruit tactics as um, being things that we can accomplish in a short to immediate time frame, low effort compared to higher return, um, little training and preparation. They're simple versus complex and basically low hanging fruit tactics are things that we can do to um, make an immediate change with the resources that we have so in terms of our brand identity um, how can brand identity be a low hanging fruit tactic and and i'm just going to close with this we're near the end of our our webinar and I just like to say one thing that every business can do is a low hanging fruit tactic is to get um, five or six of your customers together into a focus group and ask them some key questions. What um, caused you to come to this business? What were you looking for? What was the value that this business created for you? Um, what do you see as the, um, the, the real strength of this business? If you just ask those questions to a focus group of clients, to a focus group of business associates, um, that's, that's something very simple you can do. And out of that, you can, um, you'll come out with a, a stronger image of the brand of your business and, and the identity of your business, the strengths of your business. Because I remember like the, the US flag, the logo is just a symbol. The, the brand of what is an American is all those emotions and thoughts that are behind that logo of the flag. And the same with your business. Um, we want to get in touch with what's behind your business logo. What does your business really stand for? And once you get in touch with that, you know, once again, you can begin to move your business in a clear, focused direction. We'll end with that. And what I'd like to do at this point is, is just mention we have a webinar next week, um, not next week, two weeks from now, September 3rd, um, with Stan Shields. And the focus is creating multiple income streams. And, you know, everyone needs, you know, loves income streams. How do you? add income streams to um, to your financial situation and and stan shields is going to help us with that and stan is right here focus on your brand image and understanding your brand growing your brand and and finally focusing on the question, who are your clients? Do you really know your customer? Can you visualize them? Do you love them? Do they love you back? Ask these questions and you're moving toward uh, a strong brand image. I think that a problem with branding is that in any case, it's a process. It's not something that is really low hanging fruit. So there are a few things that you, obviously it's from a, a customer relationship standpoint that you have to be clear about your brand and that in the short term can help 
but if you don't have a brand and you don't have branding into that sense uh, is a little bit of a more of a longer shot to put, uh, from that perspective, which doesn't mean that is not helpful, but it's more a strategy than a tactic that can be low hanging. Okay. And, and definitely, um, that's, that's, that's very true that your brand is not something that you do and then move on to the next thing. It's something that you're continually refining over time. The low hanging, I, I would say that there, there appears to be a low hanging fruit aspect of a brand. And that's just setting your course initially and asking a few key questions to begin pointing in, um, in a direction learning um, what questions to ask, what to focus on, is just is in a way um, beginning to get an idea of your brand. That's something that you can do immediately. I think every business needs to do that. What we often do is we just jump into tactical things. And so we think in terms of, okay, um, I'm going to, I need to do something in social media. I need a website. Um, I need to do some blogging. I need to do some um, videos. And so we get into all these tactics without having that first, it could even be brief, but that first um, focus on what is my brand? Who am I? And what would I like to convey? Who would I like to convey this to? And that's where I think those, those are low, that's where there's a low hanging fruit tactic. You spend just a little time asking those key questions and setting your course. It's kind of like a ship where if you make a little change in the rudder at the beginning of the journey, um, it could end up a thousand miles different at the end, as opposed to, you know, going on the journey and gradually getting more and more off course because you haven't set your coordinates correctly. And then you've got to backtrack and, um, and go, you know, a couple thousand miles to get back to where you need to be, to get back on course. And that's where a lot of businesses are, I think, is that, is that they didn't take that, little time in the beginning to calibrate their course as far as what is my brand? What, what, um, what do I stand for? Who do I serve? Um, what value do I bring them to just answer those questions at the beginning before you jump into all the marketing um, tactics? Like, what am I going to put on social media? What am I going to put on my website? That's, that's where I think a brand image can be a low hanging fruit tactic that will really pay off. But to your point, Katia, no, it's not something that, that you just do once. It's something that that's going to, um, you're going to refine throughout your business. It's going to grow. It's going to change just like Nike changed from, what it began with um, to where it is now.